Hey everybody, this is Jason Ostrowski and welcome to the latest edition of the Everything Real Estate Podcast. I know many of you are incredibly busy out in the field right now, whether you have listings, whether you're representing buyers, many of us are go, go, go right now. So I appreciate you taking the time to listen and I want to help out this week because I think one of the biggest challenges that we face right now as realtors in this market is the appraisal. Whether you're on the buying side and and maybe you're formulating an offer, thinking about where that home would appraise, and on the listing side, maybe you're trying to price a home and you're thinking about, well, where am I going to list to make sure that this home still appraises even if we get offers above asking price? In this, what I would call unicorn of a market, it can be extremely difficult, right? So I wanted to have an expert on who has a ton of experience to talk about appraisals today. His name is Rob Luciani. Now, Rob has uh, been on both sides of the business. He's had his own brokerage in the past. He's been in real estate for a very long time, and now he is a certified appraiser and instructor in numerous places, including Temple University, Poli Associates, and the ASA, just to name a few. He brings a ton of experience when it comes to appraisals, so let's have a conversation with Rob about all things appraisals, and we'll pick it up on the other side. All right, for my conversation today, I am uh, here with Rob Luciani, who is a certified appraiser and instructor. Uh, He's been in real estate for a very long time. We need him right now. So, Rob, I'm glad you're here today. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Now, the first question I'm going to ask you is one that is probably the most relevant for agents, I think. And this is universal for as long as we've had real estate agents and real estate appraisers going to properties. Right before I came on today, I actually met an appraiser at one of my listings. And um, sometimes, you know, those appraisers are, are very willing to have you come in and give them comps. And other times they do not want to see you. And I do feel like I do feel like this appraiser in particular probably did not want me there that long. And I kind of, you know, read the body language, but my sellers wanted me to be there to meet them. So as an appraiser, and I guess this may be a personal thing, but as an appraiser, do you value agents meeting you at a property to give you comp- their own comparable properties or tell you about some upgrades or improvements in the home? How do you feel about someone meeting you there? Yeah, so personally, I do. Uh, more so in this market than ever, ever before. Okay, and so, yes, I, um, I, I, I'm open to as much information as I can obtain. And it's my job to determine what information is relevant or more relevant. And it is a personal thing because some appraisers don't necessarily feel that way, but that's the major, the minority, forgive me, the minority. You may not be aware of this, but I am because I know a lot of appraisers. Most appraisers are more than willing to accept comparable sales from agents. It's the very small minority that aren't that seem to get the acknowledgement mostly amongst real estate agents and and not so much the fact that most appraisers are open to accepting comparable sales. Yeah. And I feel like that's, you know, what I find out in the field, but you just never know. I I don't want to do something that's counterproductive. And I don't think that other agents want to, you know, do the same thing where if it's going to be counterproductive to meet an appraiser out there, we don't want to do that, but we want to make sure that you have the right information, of course. Um, what do you think is the most helpful to an appraiser? If we were to meet you at an, at a property, what do you consider to be the most helpful item that we can give you? So in, you know, things are different now. So I'm going to speak primarily from a focus of the current time, but they do sort of generally apply to all the time. But now appraisers want the most recent sales the agents are aware of because there's so many lags elsewhere, especially with public records recordings with the pandemic, with public governmental offices being closed or limited staff or working off site. We, you know, we can't confirm sales through the public records for several months. That's no good. A sale is three months old in today's market is irrelevant. Uh, last the year before the pandemic, a three-month-old sale was good. A 90-day-old sale was good. So nowadays, 
um, appraisers are saying, hey, if I can get good, recent, relevant, comparable sales from the agents that I would not otherwise be able to get through the MLS or the public records deed recordings, then that will really help me not only appraise the property so that the agent's deal will go through, but appraise it for what it's really worth in the, today's current market. Because contrary to what many agents think, you know, appraisers don't start out today thinking, how many deals could I cut today? I mean, <laughs> that's not on their agenda. <laughs> it's, it's Believe me, it is not. You know, We're like actually always concerned about, I hope I'm able to make this deal because you know that's what I want to do. But I have to sign my name on a report and I'm not going to forge it or fudge it. And so if it comes down to me or them, it's going to be them. But otherwise, I don't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, sometimes we consider you to be our favorite people on the planet. You know, I say that sarcastically, but um, it is, it is crazy because like you had said today, you know, three, a sale three months ago is not necessarily meaningless, but it's getting to that point. So do you, one of my questions, and I'm going to, I'm going to jump back and forth here, but one of my questions I was going to ask you because it kind of piggybacks off of that is, do you pour, put more emphasis on pending sales right now because of the market shifting so quickly underneath our feet? I mean, how do you put in, how do you weigh, I guess, pending sales if you do use them? So before the pandemic, um, pending sales were considered by appraisers and, and lenders um, had no issue with us providing them on a secondary basis, as long as we gave them at least three good closed sales, we could also provide some pending sales, but that's different now. In our current environment, they wanna see more pending sales because it's more indicative of what's going on. I mean, you know, right now the market, I've been doing this uh, for well over 35 years and I have, I can never ever remember a market just similar, even similar to this. I mean, this is, it's almost, and I don't mean to sound negative, it's almost like it's, it's panic buying. Mm. I, I have not seen anything like this before. And so as appraisers, it really makes our job, it's really hard to be an appraiser right now. It really I, is. I completely understand that. And just to, to back up what you're saying with some statistics, I just got this email in. Now I live in the Wissahickon School District. Um, it, it is saying, I have some stats here. The median sales price this month was 640,000. Last month, it was 560,000. Yeah. The list price versus sold price is 102% right now in Wissick and School District. That, that is just unheard of. That is amazing that we are over 100% on average for the sales price. Um, that, that is crazy. So, I had another appraiser email me this morning about another listing that I had and asked me um, how many offers I had on the property. Now, I've had appraisers say to me in the past, well, it doesn't matter how many offers you have. And then I've had others like this appraiser today uh, ask me how many I had and how we got to the number that we got to. So um, do you put an emphasis on how many offers you get and how many offers maybe over asking you get? Does that matter? In the current market, yes. In, in, pre, in prior to the pandemic, no, it wasn't real significant. But everything's different now. Every, everything is different. And so um, even days on market. I mean, many homes are selling in a week or less. Uh, so, so it's important now, days on market, how many offers, how many showings. It's all different. We're all operating with, with new rules, so to speak. So do you try and kind of catch the market, um, you know, not necessarily where it was because, you know, you're looking maybe six months in the past on average in a typical market, you're looking back about six months. Mm -hmm. Do you try and anticipate now with your appraisal where the market is, is heading? You know, uh, if we, you know, if, if appreciation is say 13% year over year last year to this year, Mm -hmm. um, do you try and catch that wave with your appraisal, like where it's heading? You know, you may not have a great comp out there at the present moment, but, you know, maybe in another couple of weeks, we may be past where this property is going to settle. So do you take that into consideration as well, where the market is heading? Yeah. Appraisers 
are permitted to do that. And there is a, um, a method to do that. We commonly refer to them as time adjustments. Um, technically, the term is called market conditions adjustments. And it's a, it's, a sim it's a, simply it's a way to say if the house sold today for 100,000 in 30 days, it will sell for 105. And then 30 days later, it will sell for 110 using a 5% number, round number. And so it's sort of a prediction. Um, lenders um, are a little leery about it, but if you provide statistics from the MLS showing just what you mentioned, how appreciation is occurring at 13% a year, so that's approximately 1% a month. So um, if, if a sale is two months old, you can time adjust it by 2% whatever, as long as you can document how you're making your time adjustment, that's a way of doing it. It's right now, it, it's, um, it, it's a method that prior to the pandemic wasn't used much because it wasn't necessary because markets were basically stable. And when they did move, they didn't move so drastically as they do now. Yeah. Um, and, and that's great information because that certainly helps helps me in in price, you know, potentially pricing a listing or, you know, when I meet an appraiser, at least the comps that I'm going to give. Um, you know, I always wondered and I know that this um, and, and I'd like to know how you get to this number. So if you have two identical homes in a neighborhood and one, say, has central air and the other one does not, but the one that doesn't have central air, air has a finished basement where the other one does not, you know, how do you weigh and how do you value uh, those items like, you know, like central air, a finished basement, updated kitchen, bathroom, how do you weigh those? Because obviously updates are different, right? A basement may have a hundred thousand dollars worth of work to it or $20,000. How do you assess a value to those yeah. items? Yeah, it's, 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 you know, more subjective than objective unfortunately, but that's why appraising isn't a pure science. It's part art, okay? And it's an acquired technique. That's why usually veteran, long-time experienced appraisers generally are a little better at it than, you know, newer rookie type appraisers, but that's the way in a lot of professions. But, you know, it's supposed to be, um, it's what's called, um, <clears throat> so those items what you mentioned are, are called amenities. And they provide, the technical term is contributory value to, to a home. Um, it's not directly related to the cost. It could be indirectly related. But contributory value means how much more would someone pay for a home with that feature? Or how much less would they pay without that feature? So if a house has central air, a person... And then he was also contemplating purchasing a house without central air. He wouldn't necessarily take the house with central air minus the cost of the central, I'd say $10,000 and say, okay, I'm going to pay $10,000 less for the one without. It's not that cut and dry. It's not that black and white, but that's essentially what appraisers try to reflect contributory value. And they, what they do is they compare, we're supposed to go through the process. Although a lot of appraisers, have this information, they already maintain it in their offices. But you go through the process of, for example, looking at several homes with central air, and creating, getting a, a range, looking at several homes similar in all aspects except for one without central air and saying, hey, you know, generally speaking, the homes with central sell for about X dollars more. Mm -hmm. And maybe convert that into a percent, let's say 5%. So, okay. So now I know I can make an adjustment of about 5%. Okay. All right. So along those same lines, if you have two identical homes that are in the same neighborhood, and I've had this happen before, um, they're the same layout, same upgrades, same, you know, everything, but one sits on one side of the street that backs up to preserved land and privacy and open space. And then the other backs up to railroad tracks. <laughs> um, now, you still hear the train on the opposite side of the street, 
but you're not backing up to the train tracks themselves. Mm -hmm. So how does an appraiser approach that type of issue? And I guess the weight on that. Yeah. He would use the same methodology that I just described. He would try and see if he could find some properties that have sold that backed up to the, you know, wooded area or that backed up to the train tracks and see if there was any significant difference in sale price. And I got to tell you at times, as odd as this sounds, and you may think there would be, sometimes we, we find out, you know what? There's no difference. For whatever reason, people are not finding that to be a deterrent or pay, to pay less for a property. So it's not about what the appraiser thinks. I would never buy a house that backs up the train tracks. That's not what it's about. It's not personal. It's analyzing the market. And if the market says to me, I pay the same price with the house that's on one side as the other side, then guess what? That's what I reflect regardless of my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. And and along, along those same lines again, and I think this is a question that a lot of agents have is that, do you consider a pool to be a net negative, a net positive, or a net neutral? You know, assuming that they don't put in a waterfall and, you know, fancy, you know, decking around it and, you know, it has all the bells and whistles. Obviously, there's going to be value for that if there's an outside fireplace to it, all that. But just a, a typical in-ground pool outside, is that considered to be a positive, a negative, or a neutral? Yeah. Well, the thing about pool is that deters a lot of people especially people with young children is, and there's a lot of maintenance issues with the pool. A lot of folks would not want it. You know, I, I would have always loved to have had a pool in my house, but I'm not a maintenance guy and I don't want to pay all that money. So I, you know, I'll, I'll just, you know, give up the, that idea to have it because I don't want to deal with the maintenance. But besides that, again, it's essentially, even though it is generally considered a pool would be a positive amenity and would have contributory value, and that is the exact technical term, appraisers have to once again do the analysis. What's the market telling me? And I can tell you, Jason, it's a lot of it has to do with the location. For example, in South Beach, Florida, Miami, you probably can't sell a house that doesn't have a pool. Mm -hmm. okay? In Anchorage, Alaska, do you need a pool? <laughs> I would think probably not, you know, <laughs> considering you could probably dive into a glacier nearby, you know. Um, so it's your market too. So some markets, it, it would be neutral, as you mentioned. Um, other markets, it would be mandatory. Mm -hmm. Having a pool in Miami Beach would be just as relevant as having a, a garage somewhere else, you know, or finished basement or a deck. They're, they're, they're popular nowadays. Everybody likes decks. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that makes total sense. Um, you know, we're seeing this phenomenon nowadays and, you know, it used to happen before, but it's definitely becoming more prevalent where, you know, just personally speaking, I'm not trying to, you know, to call anybody out, but we're seeing this phenomenon of agents raising the sales price right before going under contract in the MLS. So, you know, a, a property um, sells well over asking, and now this agent then raise, quickly raises the sale price in the MLS to match, um, you know, to match that price reflective in the MLS, thinking that maybe it would somehow influence the appraiser to, to help the appraisal. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of that? Probably not going to because the appraiser will be able to see the prior list, uh, list listing price and he'll be able to figure out that it probably was done for that particular reason. So it's, there's no, there's no real benefit in trying to do that. You know, an appraiser would rather you be honest with him and um, appraisers, you know, are aware of the crazy market and they're just looking for ways if a property is worth what it's sold for. I got to be able to prove it. I got to be able to document it because my name gets signed on a dotted line. And it's, it's not magic. And lenders don't take what we say as gospel. Mm -hmm. we, we, we say a house is worth something. They want to see the proof. Okay. It's not, it's not, they take more. So 
And that's probably not, you know, not going to help. And even as far as MLS, it's funny, this comes up a lot. It's, and I try to tell agents this whenever I have an opportunity to speak to them. Um, it's in your best interest to put as much accurate information in your MLS descriptions as possible. It helps us do our job better. And so even though you're not appraisers, and I don't expect you to understand what we need in the MLS, but what we need mostly in a generalized way is as much accurate information as you can put, because your eyes are our eyes. We don't get to see the inside of the property. Mm -hmm. And the more we know about, the properties that the folks list and sell and market, the better we're able to use that information to do more accurate appraisals. So simple question here. Why do appraisers take pictures when they go out to a property? Because lenders require it. Okay. Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, and VA, and all major banks and mortgage companies want pictures. People like pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's very, sim very simply put. And, that, and the reason why I'm asking this question is because I know that the banks want to see them and specifically, you know, maybe the underwriters. How is your relationship nowadays with underwriters? Because I do find that more today than at any other period that I've seen, and maybe this is just anecdotal, I find that the underwriters are getting involved more in the appraisals that come back. Is that reflective of the market that we're in right now, where an appraiser goes out and appraises it just fine, and then the underwriter may flag it for something? Probably now more so than before the pandemic because of the panic buying that's going on. Mm -hmm. And the funny, this funny thought just popped in my mind. Recently, well, not recently, maybe about a year or two ago, I got a new client. Uh, it was a bank. And um, I did my first appraisal for them and sent it in. And they got back to me and were a little upset because I didn't have enough pictures in the appraisal. Mm -hmm. I, I included about like a dozen photographs, you know, every angle, the front, the back, the rear, the inside, the living room, kitchen. I thought was normal, typical. And he was like, oh, you got to take more pictures. We want to take, we want you to take a picture of everything, every room, every this, every, day. I was like, it's no problem. I said, digital camera, there's no cost. I said, I just didn't know what you, like. so there's the proof. Once I heard that, I'm like, yeah, people, doesn't matter whether you're a bank, a mortgage company, FHA, people love pictures. That's why we do it. As far as underwriters are concerned, once again, what's their job to look at our appraisals to see if they're make, they make sense and they're supported. And, and we can document what we say. Yeah. I know it's frustrating for agents that sometimes we think we're good to go with the appraisal and then the underwriter gets involved. I can't think of a more frustrating thing for a real estate agent. And, you know, we kind of, you know, we kind of freak out and, and wonder why that is, um, you know, but I, I understand everybody's got a job to do underwriters included. So I'm not bashing underwriters, but. No, I know. And, and the unfortunate thing is, and, and by the way, many of them can be bashed. But um, <laughs> because they're not, for the most part, appraisers. Mm -hmm. And so when they critique an appraisal, many times they know less than the appraiser. Yes. And so, if, in my opinion, they may be focusing on something that's not significant. And then making that an issue for the agent when it shouldn't be that way. Okay. So... Yeah. So let's, let's talk about, I just want to ask one more question along those lines. Like if we, you know, we have all as agents, we've all had appraisals come up short and now we want to challenge the appraisal and some appraisers are just absolutely 100% steadfast. They're not going to accept any more comps. They're not going to change anything. It is what it is. Others are more open to to doing that. Now it's our right to challenge it. So you know how do you how do you approach that um, when someone does challenge one of your appraisals? Well, appraisers should be aware that according to the, the federal law that was passed a few years ago, you remember the Dodd Frank Act? Yes. So there's provisions in there. It says that uh, an appraiser must um, um, provide 
be responsive to one request to a, what's known as a reconsideration of value. Mm-hmm. So it has to be done through the lender. The agent or anyone else can't contact the appraiser directly. If they would, we would be responsible to say, have the information submitted to me through the lender. So it's not being uncooperative. That's the way the law says it's supposed to be done. Comes through the lender and the lender will then provide the comparables to the appraiser and request that the appraiser consider these to see if they're better, not equal to, better than the ones he used. Otherwise, there's no point in adjusting the value. Most appraisers, and I'm not defending appraisers because I am one. I'm defending them because not only I'm one, but I teach them and I see what they do. Most appraisers do go through great lengths to use the best possible comparable sales they could find. They spend a lot of time, a lot of time searching and searching and researching and searching and say, okay, there's nothing better out there. This is it. Once in a, and the reason why appraisers have this preconceived notion that this is it, I'm not, I'm not gonna, because once in a, and so most of the time, Jason, the stuff that gets submitted to me is, is the sales that we have already discarded mm-hmm. and considered not relevant for our appraisal. And they get thrown back at us and we see right away, these are the ones I decided not to use. They're not better than the one, but every once in, in a blue moon, one comes up and says, oh, you know, I did, I was not aware of that particular one. Must have closed like within the last couple of days. The agent was aware of it. So that's helpful. But that's few and far between. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I had an appraisal last year that I challenged. And this this was an interesting scenario. So I had a duplex in Roxborough right across the street. So 19128, right across the street in Maniunk, there was probably the best comp. Like it was literally one block. It was one street away. I I could throw a football through its window, (laughs) right? 19127. The appraiser, the first appraiser, would not take into consideration um, that property because it was not 19128, even though I do consider Roxborough and Maniunk to be pretty homogenous and where this where this property, they were both duplexes, and where this one sat was more Maniunk, in my opinion, than mm-hmm. Roxborough. Mm-hmm. He would not take that into consideration, and we did not appraise. And I fought the appraisal to no avail. We actually paid to have another appraisal done. The next appraiser did take that property into consideration, and the property appraised actually over the sales price. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine the frustration that that I would yeah. have as an agent where it almost blew up our sale um, because, you know, he wouldn't take a property right across the street. So, how, I mean, how do you, I know you have to cut it off somewhere, but how do you feel about that? Well, unfortunately, that appraiser was ridiculous. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. I never heard one block. It's a different zip code. So what? It was crazy. It was a number. 19127 is a number. It's not a market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and appraisers can't be that blind. So you just, unfortunately, Jason, you just got stuck with a dud. That's all. Well, (laughs) I'm glad you're saying that because I honestly, I think it confuses us sometimes, you know, as agents, you know, what we can and can't can't use. I mean, I I truly obviously try to stick to the neighborhood first and the the zip code, the school district, all that good stuff. Try and stay within a certain, um, you know, mile marker if I can. Um, But yeah, sometimes it is confusing to us. So I'm glad you clarified that. And I'm glad that, you know, I can use that as fodder in the future should I come across another appraiser that maybe wouldn't take into consideration something like that. Okay, so I wanted to ask you kind of a a fun appraisal question, because I've always wondered this, that, you know, every once in a while, we come across a property that is completely unique. And so maybe it's an 1840s farmhouse uh, that, you know, has five outbuildings. It has a bank barn. It may, maybe it has an equestrian ring, you know, how do you find comparable properties to something like that? How hard is that for you, the appraiser? Very, very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah. Um, and, um, a lot of times it's, it's very far from being an exact science or even an inexact science. Okay, so 
we may have to, you know, uh, compare land size and try to find some, maybe focus on what the land might be worth if it's a couple acres. Um, we might have to focus on what, um, sometimes they refer to that as a gentleman's ranch because you're not breeding horses there, but someone might, who might like to own horses and have a paddock. So mm-hmm. forth. those are difficult ones. I personally would, don't enjoy when I get one of those kind of jobs. Uh, <laughs> you know, they take a long time. It's a lot of work and you never charge it as much that you need to do it, but it's difficult. They're unique. And um, there's no there's no one way of doing it. I mean, the only thing I could say to you is that um, there are some guys, they're few and far between, who have taken um, the interest in sort of making that like a sub specialty, and that they've done those types. And the more they do them, the more they get comfortable with them, and they maintain some personal databases and things. And so, if you could find a guy who has experience doing those, that would be helpful. If it's somebody who's never done one, that's going to be a disaster. Yeah, it seems like definitely like a niche market. It would it would be. I'm I'm assuming you'd have to go into multi counties and you know far and wide to find. Maybe somebody from Lancaster could come down this yeah. neck of the woods, you know, because they they, they might be more prevalent up there. You know, that yeah, makes that makes total sense. I mean, I I think that makes sense, and I guess that. Um, do you find that to be kind of similar to, let's say you have a rundown property that's dilapidated, you know, it, it needs to be torn down, but it's in a good location. It's got 15 acres and now, you know, you want to subdivide it. It is subdividable. Um, you know, do you, let's say you can get 12 lots out of that p- potential subdivision. Do you then calculate, you know, what say one lot is going for and then times it by 12 to, to get, you know, it's worth, how do you calculate a subdividable plot of land like that, that has multiple lots? Yeah, that might be one way of looking at it, but, um, that's a little bit, um, misleading because, the process of subdivision takes time, a lot of money, legal work involved. And so um, thinking how much a, a one lot would be worth, that's already subdivided. So there's no legal ramifications. Everything's been established. When you have a larger property that has to be subdivided, all those costs involved. So you look at it in that case, I would look at the entire, how many acres did you say it was? 15. 15. I would look at the entire 15 acres and try to get a, um, a feel for what a larger parcel like that. It didn't have to be 15. It could be eight acres. It could be 19 acres. But, you know, we work with larger and smaller numbers. Try to get an idea of what a larger parcel would be worth as vacant ground, which is available to be subdivided, but not yet subdivided. Okay. So, all right. Last question to you. If you were to give advice to, to any real estate agent out there, um, you know, what do you think would help price listings accurately the most, or, you know, help us out in the field to make sure that we're pricing the home correctly from an appraisal point of view? Well, do uh, you want me to answer that question based on today's market? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Today's market. I should preface that because I know it's completely different. I think, I think that's the, Rob, that's the the key question, right? We go out to these listing appointments and, you know, all sellers want to drive up their price as much as possible. And, you know, someone's probably willing to pay it right now because you had mentioned, you know, panic buying before. Yeah. Um you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to equate to an, an appraisal that comes out in your favor. So how, how do you, th- how, what advice would you give an agent trying to price in this well, market? Keep in mind, uh, in, this, in this crazy market, um, but first of all, an appraisal is really only required if the purchaser is going to get a loan, a mortgage loan. Mm-hmm. So I always say this, and I've said this to my students, not the veteran appraisers, but the student when I teach the introductory courses, I say anybody can pay anything they want for a property as long as they're using their own money. You want to pay double what the people are asking and you got your own money, go for it. It's a free country. It's a capitalist country. Bottom line is if you're going to buy a property with somebody else's money, then you got some hoops to jump through, don't you? One of those hoops is an appraisal. 
Okay. So sometimes folks, agents, even buyers and sellers, but they're okay if they don't think about it because they're not professionals. But us real estate people are professionals. We need to keep in mind, why am I going through this? Why am I having issues with underwriting? Why am I having issues with appraisers? Because they need somebody else's money. And people don't throw money around without making you jump through hoops. So now the hoop we're dealing with is the appraisal hoop. Okay. And that's how agents should explain it to their not so you know curt as that, but that's how they should explain it to their 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 sellers and buyers. You know, we're doing this because we need a loan. If you need a loan, we could pretty much do whatever we want. So so then you think, okay, if I need to deal with an appraiser and an underwriter, um, I need to think about what they're going to think and what they're going to want and what they're going to see when they do start doing their job. And so as appraisers, as I mentioned earlier, we start each day thinking, I hope I have enough sales, whatever, information, market statistics, like you mentioned some school district statistics. That's all good information. Mm -hmm. I hope I have enough of this so that when I get this assignment, I'm able to document it and sign my name to it without perjuring myself. Okay. <laughs> and so whatever it is you think you can help the appraiser with, I'm not saying to tell people don't price your house so high because, you know, to try to discourage someone from getting the most they can get. That's your job. But then again, you, you might say to them, if we're lucky enough to get a cash buyer, the sky's the limit. However, if we're going to be restricted to, buyers that need financing, then we have to be prepared to deal with underwriters and appraisers. Well, that's a great answer. And I'm going to leave it there. I think you you gave us a lot of great information. I think you're kind of helping the the fog of appraisals in in this uh, this time period of this crazy market. Um, you had mentioned earlier, we've never seen anything like it. So so your you know your advice and, and your wisdom on the subject is much appreciated. Yeah, it's good talking to you. And I'll talk to you again sometime. Happy. Thanks a lot, Robert. Take care. That was the interview with Rob Luciani. A couple takeaways that I had from our talk together. You know, it's funny, when we stopped recording that, Rob asked me to, to make sure that I tell the agents that appraisers are here to help. And I think we have to remember that when we're out in the field, and I know that this is a high pressure, high stress business, and we're trying to make all these parts kind of move in the same direction, get to the finish line, that appraisers are there to do their job. They're not out to get us. They're not out to get the property, which leads me to my first takeaway is that most appraisers want you to meet them at the property. They want you to give them comparable sales because if they miss something, then they have a backup with you, right? You're providing the latest sales that maybe they missed. And so we should always meet the appraiser at the property and do our best to give them comps. Number two, in this market, in this very crazy and you know unique market that we're in, things have shifted a little bit differently in terms of appraisals. Maybe they're going to use more pendant sales. So maybe you want to provide more pendant sales to the appraiser. You want to provide an upgrade list or an itemized list of improvements that the owner has made at the property. That's going to help your cause. And then you want to make sure that you tell the appraiser that you had multiple offers on the property, and that's why you ended up at you know, 20, 25, 30,000 above asking. Lastly, Rob talked about appraisals being not only a science, but it is a form of art. You know, there is some subjectiveness to every appraisal. And that's why maybe appraisals may not work out in our favor. But always remember, it is your right to challenge an appraisal should it come back short. You have to do it through the lender, but you can challenge that appraisal and always remember that you have that right. Well, that's it for the episode this week. We'll be back in a few weeks with a new topic, new guest. And as always, make sure that you subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcast. And while you're there, please do us a favor and leave us a review. But in the meantime, remember to stay safe out there, stay selling, and we'll catch you next time on the Everything Real Estate Podcast.